We got, we'll do five quick ones. Who's going to go? <laughs> Shane Height, you're a little slow. Come on. <laughs> That's okay. I thought you would jump right over that. I'll do one. There you go. So yesterday morning, I get up, I'm doing my kind of regular, or I wake up and I'm doing my regular thing, like hanging out in bed and praying and stuff like that. And all of a sudden I had this rush of speaking in tongues. Like it was, sometimes you're reaching for it, but this time it just, you know, it was coming at me. And as soon as I got done, I had this, uh, thought that I should call my niece Bethany. So I did. I called up Bethany and that she had just like, you know, completed like a temporary job. So she was out of work again. And that um, she had a recent breakup in a relationship that, you know, had um, gotten to the level of an engagement. And so it was quite a, you know, disappointing breakup and stuff. And so I spent quite a bit of time talking to her and she came to John's fellowship last night. Wow. Hmm. Exciting. Very cool. That is cool. 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 All right, there's one. We've got four more. Let's go. Who's next? So Janet speaks. I'd like to hear your most exciting moment for the last week because I just haven't talked to you in so long. Oh, okay. Here's one. So uh, my, my dear friend Beth um, was diagnosed with cancer in January. And so for the last four months, um, we've been on this journey of prayer and, um, you know, through her chemo, two rounds of chemo. And um, so last night over at the shelter, um, she filled me in on her most recent update. And that was, oh, um, her most recent update was that her, they can't see anything left on her x-rays. She met with the radiologist because that was the original plan, but they're pretty confident that they're not even going to need to do that. Yeah. So she is, she's really, really, it, it's been quite a journey through some deep and dark challenges, but it's been such a tremendous um, witness that how God just carried her through that and different people coming alongside her with words of encouragement, words of what but when necessary. Um, it, it's just been a really, really incredible journey. So that's that's gotta be the highlight. Thanks, Janet, that's great. That's great. Who else? Thank you. Donna, anything happening in the world of Donna Cutelli? Yeah, a few things. Um, Michelle kind of, Michelle Ruth taught something about speaking in tongues that um, really sparked some joy in my heart. Um, you know, of course, I've been doing it for like 40 years now. Um, you know, and I love prayer. It's kind of like my thing. But something she shared about language, and I, it, it was just so different than just this dry teaching about well, excuse me, I, I, I don't want to insult anybody. <laughs> the theology <laughs> behind it, you know, the theology behind it. Uh, but it was so inspiring. It really thrilled me because that particular share that she did, I believe she was really walking with the Father. And I just was so puzzled with my prayer life, thinking it was so dry and it was so mundane. And, you know, why speak in tongues for hours for everybody? You know, I don't always. And, you know, it just really kind of corrected my faulty thinking and inspired me and you know it gave me great joy just the simplicity of what she shared and um the other day I was real bugged to top it off uh, one of my high points is that you know I'm in physical therapy for my right side who knows why I've been in you know nine car accidents bounced off highways and here I am so praise God for that I'm still clicking and ticking and my brain still works it's amazing um I don't, I, I can't even think back without shuddering. Uh, but anyways, um, so I've been going to this doctor and he decides to retire without calling me up. And here I am in crisis the other day and I'm supposed to get this assessment and no doctor. I mean, he just retires, you know, and it leaves me high and dry. And I would never have known that, but I was praying and I had the thought, call this doctor. 
you know, before just, there was just this urgency to call this doctor, what, to find out that he retired? Thank you very much. What am I going to do with my spinal issues now? However, you know, I just inquired and like within 24 hours, I had a brand new doctor, a brand new day and a brand new setup, which the first time around, it took me three months in total agony to get a doctor to take my case. It was like this 24 hour thing and it was just taken care of. I really think the Lord put it in my heart to call. For me, it's a big issue with doctors, you know, because I, I'm not really delighted in them. I'm glad they're there, but I'm traumatized. So to me, it was just the Lord talking to me about a concern thing and, you know, to make that urgent call. So it all kind of like turned around in my favor again of God's care for me and his provision in the medical, in the medical sense. So that's, that's kind of what's going on for me. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Who else? Most exciting event. Yeah, go ahead, Doug and Sandy. Sandy and Doug. Well, Doug and I had this house fire in January, and we're still living in an apartment. And the only thing that's been done is the roof has been put on since January. So we, I've been just stressed out of my mind about it. And I've been praying about it and speaking in tongues about it. And listening to people's talk and, and I think it was it's Sunday or last week. I can't remember which, which fellowship it was, but um, somebody mentioned that God knows every single thing that's going on in your life and he cares about every single thing. And I'm just, I started to claim that thinking I shouldn't be worrying about this. It's too much stress for me. It's, you know, it's just going on for too long. It's going to cost us an extra $40,000. And above and beyond the insurance and I'm going oh, I just can't handle this so we go to meet the contractor today and I was continuing to pray and I was telling myself you just need to let it go and let God and you know just believe he's going to be there for you it's all going to work out and it, it's not going to cost us forty thousand dollars extra everything is going to be done the way that we wanted it done of course they haven't really done anything yet but it's in the future and it's coming and just not having to pay that extra forty thousand dollars was a lot because we're both retired and it's not like we don't have any money, but it's like that's a lot of money. A lot of money. And so I don't know. I just feel at peace about it because we yes. talked to them and it all seemed to just fall into place. I'm sure it was Donna or Michelle that said something that just hit me. I'm sure. Oh. Praise God. That's very cool. Very cool, Sandy. Yeah, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Erin? That was just a thumbs up to them. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. It I'm down like in North Carolina, and uh, I'm at the beach in North Carolina, and I'm having a little bit of internet issues with the rental, but we'll see how this holds up. How's the beach? Uh, it's great. I went fishing yesterday or whatever day. I've lost track of time down here. I'm beach time, but uh, caught uh, 21 mackerel, Spanish mackerel. Oh, wow. So we've got fish in the freezer now. And I'm going to hopefully, if the weather cooperates, I'm going out for mahi mahi on Friday. Oh, yeah. Those 21, did you catch off off a boat or off yeah. the beach? Off a boat. <laughs> yep. That's enough fish for 15 weeks. That's what it is when I fish when I go there. <laughs> What'd you say, John? I said, you know, I go there a couple of weeks after she does, there's no fish. <laughs> she, she's, she's caught the I left you a few. <laughs> I left some, John. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> well, that sounds fun. Cool. Anybody else? Kevin uh, Rouse has his hand up. All right, Kevin, and then we'll go to Carol. Go ahead, Kevin. It's all you. Needed. Hello? Yep, Kevin, you're up. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I wanted to share an insight that God has given me recently. Um, you know, in the book of Matthew's there where it talks about how, you know, God won't give you a, a stone if you ask for bread. Mm -hmm. Well, from that verse there, you know, God's opened up an insight to me that I haven't seen before. And that is... You know, when you're praying for something, for strength, like maybe you're tired at work, you know, and your legs are hurting and you're praying for strength. 
and um, or you're going to work and you're praying for strength and you get there and your coworker forgets to leave the keys to the floor cleaner behind or something like that. Mm-hmm. Well, um, the incident that I dealt with yesterday and God gave me the insight was that you know, I'm praying for strength, you know, for my legs and my knees and things that are hurting, you know. Well, my coworker forgets to leave the keys behind, you know. And mm-hmm. we're not the, supposed to blame God, you know. But the adversary will work in little ways like that when you're praying for strength or something, you know. Mm-hmm. And suddenly something comes your way. The insight that God gave me was for me not to blame him for the fact that, you know, now I had to run all over this concrete floor in this huge warehouse without being able to do the job correctly, you know. And what I saw was that God will not give us a stone, and a stone is a hard, complicated, difficult thing when we're praying for good. You know, praying for strength is good. Well, God didn't cause that guy to forget those keys, you know? Right. And um, subtly at first I thought, well, thanks, God. Now I got to really run around just to make me strong, you know? (laughs) Well, no, of course it wasn't. And after I Mm. realized that and stopped blaming God for that little jab in the the side there about not having a key, me having to do it the hard way, he was able to give me strength because I became grateful and recognized his goodness. See if I can do this up. That's great. Thanks, Kevin. That's You're great. Welcome. Hey, Carol. Hi there. You know how you sometimes are watching Facebook or some other thing on the internet? All of a sudden, somebody pops up and starts talking. Well, today we watched, see if I can do this. Okay. We watched this man. Um, um, give his testimony about how he was a drug addict and an alcoholic and how God has turned his life around. Come on, help me. <laughs> and You're doing good. But he was saying, it's the blood of Jesus, it's the blood of Jesus, and he, only God can help you. And, and he was saying, I go to church now to get high. <laughs> and I thought, wow, where have I been? You know, I think it's been too long since I was in the in the gutter <laughs> and so it was refreshing to hear someone like this and he said my testimony if i can just reach one person this will be worth it and it was so inspiring he showed you know he, he talked about his job yeah four four years you know. four years it took him but he said you know he only worked six months on a job and finally got a promotion and then he went on christian mingle and he met a lady and you know, he's got a house and he showed the picture of the house and, and he said, I'm going to church and I'm going to get high. And I thought, woo! Now, you know, just thinking what a great testimony it was for me. So that was my highlight of the day. That's great. Thanks. David, I have something exciting that happened this week. Thanks, Dad. This past Saturday, uh, we attended the wedding of my son Gabriel and his wonderful bride, Emily. It was an awesome time. Great time. John Shane Knight was there and John and Genevieve. And, uh, it was, it was really, really beautiful. Um, in spite of being done in a Catholic church, it was still really beautiful. And, uh, uh, Christ was at the center of the entire thing. So it was great time. And they then on Sunday in 104 degree, uh, temperatures we loaded up a u-haul truck and um, and then they took off for omaha nebraska they got there safely wow. today and are just about ready to finish up unloading the truck so they're out there with my other son john and my daughter-in-law amanda so uh he'll be back on fellowship on sunday if any of you are attending fellowship he will uh be teaching at our fellowship on sunday so but uh, it was great. It was a great time. It was really wonderful. It was great. Thanks, Dennis. Happy Father's Day in 104 heat. 
<laughs> How's Ireland, Pat? Was it? What's uh, that? I was asking Pat, how's Ireland? He's muted. Yeah, okay, there you are. Yeah, good. Um, well, I'm enjoying it because I'm on holidays and uh, the weather is improving and uh, we're supposed to have a heat wave and that's 27 degrees centigrade. That's very hot for us in the next yeah. few days. So looking forward to that. Okay. Um, what time is it for you now? It's um, 51 minutes past midnight. So it's 10 to 1. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, Pat, someone was talking about that last week. Uh, I forget who it was, and they're just saying how blessed they were that you know you were up in the middle of the night. That this is I forget who I was talking to, but somebody was saying how cool is it that Pat's on this call? So thanks so much. Oh, it's a real blessing for me. It's really great to be in a live fellowship, um, you know, with other people as well. We we have one here on a Sunday, and that's great. But just uh, to just have this international doesn't matter that it's international as you said it's great to have like-minded people to uh fellowship with and it's just great i mean we listen to the podcast and they're great too but there's nothing better th than than uh face to face really you know we're, we're uh, you know miles apart but that doesn't really matter it's, it's such a, a step up for for me um and uh tina my wife is in bed she's working tomorrow so she's going to be uh really keen to join the, the fellowship very shortly in the next few weeks. Right. So, um, so and the, and the boys too, they're going to be here. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Amen. Yeah. That's cool. So um, let's pray together. And, and if you have a need or something you'd like to share, talk, uh, pray, however you want to do it. Um, I have, um, so I was thinking greatest, greatest blessings. And I would also, you know, we'll do, uh, greatest challenges as well. I think we'll hit some of that next week. So I had a couple thoughts. One would be, it might be cool if you think about it uh, next week about sharing about uh, you know, either the power of prayer or the power of God in, like, and even pray for the power of God to show up. Um, <laughs> I was thinking of you, Dave DeMars. I was walking through a mall today. I'm in Minneapolis. Uh, <laughs> and I was speaking in tongues and kind of doing it out loud as I was, you know, talk to myself. I walked by somebody. I thought I should. I should shut up. And I thought, no, you know, actually, I don't think I will. And I mean, what? I thought, what? What if it's a believer who goes, "Are you speaking in tongues?" I thought that would be kind of a cool thing. <laughs> and I was thinking about speaking in tongues and the power of God, um, and about but Carol, like you, the power of God is at work, and Jesus is flooding, and you know, speaking in tongues is miraculous. It is, you know. Are you speaking? I, I thought, what if the guy says to me, are you speaking to yourself? And I said, no, I'm actually speaking the wonderful works of God. <laughs> so I just thought it would be kind of like, hey, that's not a bad conversation to get into. Um, but also thinking that, he was teaching it to some of my kids. Um, uh, but I have a previous marriage that I was in that I have a daughter who has a thing called gluteric acidemia. And so she's 27 years old and is bedridden, has been her entire life. Um, and her mom, who takes care of her almost 24-7, I was talking to on Father's Day, actually, and um, she is really looking for Rachel to get up and get off uh, her bed. And it, it, it is a miraculous thing. So I told her I would pray for this week. We're also, uh, but it's just, <laughs> it's a great community to be in the power of prayer together and to see the power of God work. And I think that as there are great things happening in all of our lives, uh, there are also challenges in all of our lives. And, uh, you know, I, I was somehow I had this thought today um, about, boy, when you walk in Revelation, everything, everything goes well, no, you never have any problems. And I, and I was still like, how many times was Apostle Paul stoned, beaten, whipped, kicked, out of work, you know? And it wasn't like, oh, gee, Paul, you should really walk by the Spirit more. Because, you know, that whipping wouldn't have happened and that this and that stoning and that. I don't know. You know, when G, when Jesus called me, talked talk to Ananias, he said, let me tell you, I'm going to I need to talk to him. So I'm going to tell him how many great things he's going to suffer for my namesake. Kind of like was like the opening day. So I don't know that it's all about, gee, you know, so I, I just, one of the things I loved about, about what I love about us and others is that 
this is not about putting on a happy face and all everything being great. It's often about actually things aren't great and I need help, I need support. And that's part of what this fellowship, our, our intent is, is to do, be able to do both of those things. And I think we're doing that, you know, and Aaron, I think over time we're gonna continue as people get to know each other, the comfort level will go up about sharing things, et cetera. And that's just the nature of any community, any relationship. The more that we know each other, the more we get to understand each other, the more people will take risk and share sort of what's, you know, the, both sides of the fence, both the good news and the challenging. And I, I think we're working our way in there. But anyway, that's one of the things I'd like to pray about tonight is my daughter, Rachel. So I think I'll start. And then whoever would like to pray, if somebody wants to, you know, if you want to feel led to manifest, please do. Uh, we'll then have a song from the Mars. Um, and uh, then Jeff and Jerry are ready to roll. So um, I'll start. <laughs> Heavenly Father, and Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you in the name, I thank you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, for his perfect work, for his complete redemption of us, body, soul, and spirit. I thank you for Connie and for her incredible heart. How much she loves you, trusts you, has dedicated her life to you, and how what a great mother she is. And thank you for her forbearance and for her strength, like Kevin was talking about, you know, she needs strength. Thank you for healing Rachel. Thank you for bringing the power of God into her being in her life. Mm -hmm. Thank you for her complete redemption and salvation and for her wholeness. Thank you for your power of your son, which you raised from the dead, that we have that power within us. We have the power to heal. We have the power to raise people from the dead. We have the power of the miraculous. Thank you for bearing your arm and your strength and bringing that power to pass. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Father God, I lift my daughter to you. And I, I ask you for grace, mercy toward her and um, heal her heart. And also, tomorrow that um, she's going to settle her divorce. And I ask you for whatever is fair and just and your inner being in that court system and lawyers, whoever around her and just don't let her broke her heart any more than what she is. And I ask you for continuously draw her near you at this time. And I see that and then it's like a child childbirth and then it's a pain of a, uh, just going through a lot of pain. But I see there's a bright light end of a tunnel and she's coming back to you. And I thank you and you continuously draw her near and give her strength in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you and lift to you my wonderful sister Rochelle. That you continue to strengthen her and energize her after now that the memorial of her past husband is taken care of, that you can just continue to work in her heart to bless her because she's got a lot of stuff to have to deal with now and that she hasn't been messing with. But uh, and I also thank you for strengthening me as I've offered her. Anytime she needs me, anytime to give me a call, and I know she will. So I just thank you for her life and <clears throat> for blessing her mightily this day. In Jesus' name. Father, I also want to uh, lift up before my brothers and sisters um, my life and my future, and um, especially the farm that I live on. and. I know that it is a gift from you and um, 
but I also know circumstances have changed. I know, Father, that the the challenges of living in that city um, can be overwhelming. I just ask if if possible in your grace and your mercy, you can expand my vision um, so that I know and can be confident that I am where you want me to be and doing what you want me to be doing so that I'm not spinning my wheels. And I know your promises that you say you will provide no matter what. And that even as the adversary spins up, um, more and more issues and more and more problems with being there that you you promise that you will provide. Um, just ask that you make a way for me and that you give me clarity. And I ask this in Christ's name. Father, I ask you to the have your hand of protection and blessing over our communities and especially over this city that we're living in right now. I lift the Jackson family to you, Father, as they struggle through the sudden loss of their grandmother this week and also to the families of those of the two police officers that were shot and killed as they work to provide protection for our city this week. And Father, I ask you just to cut comfort the hearts of these families and to to help them see that that you are there with them and you walk with them and protect them and and to help them just heal through this difficult time in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, I thank you for my friend, his daughter. I thank you also, Father, for her healing and for her mind. And Lord, for your direction to deliver her from her particular afflictions at this time, Father. Thank you for working in her heart that she allows you, Lord, to expand her horizons, to fully deliver her, Father, from the things that have from the ghosts of the past, Lord, so that she can be a liberated woman in Christ Jesus and, and be full-bodied in her expression without addiction, Father, and without wounds. Thank you, Father, for your peace, for her mom and her family, for um, working in her grandparents, Father, to find a, a, a caring place to live in their old age with their uh, supplied nurses and health care workers, Father. And I thank you for strengthening my friend, Kim, in her mind and in her body to turn to you, Lord, and to return again to the body of Christ. And Father, that she can return to your word as never before and find her real need to be met in you, Father, the full supply of who you are. Only you're able, Father, to quench that thirst and fulfillment and give us purpose and meaning in life. And I'm so grateful that I know that. And Lord, that you have led my heart to a place of great peace. I thank you, Lord, for all that you have given us through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Eko ose stes te libi ki tu shun su libi ka aan de seis. Hoka on de se otosh. Shalavaka osa te lebe ki tu shus. Suluku osun ti lebaka. Karan karan ka kaloko te shisa. Sodo so katoshis. Oh, our Heavenly Father, you are beautiful. You are wonderful. You are such an example to us, for you continue to love us. You continue to bless us when we get involved with our own stuff, when we ignore you, when we forget you. You never forget us. You keep track of every single hair on our head. Oh, Heavenly Father, what a wonderful Father you are. Victory is mine, saith the Lord. Don't fight the battles on your own. Your action is to look to me. Come to me, 
give me your struggles, give me your problems, and then be at peace. Know that I hear you, know that I care about you, know that when action can be taken by me, I will take it on your behalf. When I set you before me, there is nothing else that I see but that which I have created within you. You focus so much on what you are not, but I focus on what you are. So I ask you to get your thinking aligned with my thinking so that you can see yourself the way I see you, so that you can have joy and not be so focused on the struggles. As I have said, let me fight those battles so that you can have peace and that you can have rest in me because I have already accomplished the work. Remember what I've told you in my word, that these times are short. And they're not even to be compared to what I have in store for you. You are righteous in my sight. You are lovely to me. So continue to keep your eyes focused on me, not on the things around you, for they are shallow and they are temporary, but we are eternal. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for uh, you giving us it, uh, the great hope in eternally so we can draw strength, uh, strength and then uh, ankle into that and, uh, and we can still have a peace because knowing that you are always care for us, watching over us and you continuously help us in positive way. It doesn't matter how dark it seems, it may, and you always come through us. And I thank you for your faithfulness, your power, your grace, your mercy. I thank you in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Can we just check? We can keep things happening here. So that was lovely. Um, Okay, so we have the uh, weekly, it, it, it's kind of like the Saturday Night Live weekly news update, but it's the DeMars singing, so it's not quite the same thing. Hey, um, Dave, we are a little, little t back, so could we do the song in a, in a brief summary? Not yeah, it was a brief summary. Thanks. Okay. It is difficult to realize that this beloved devotional hymn, which expresses so profoundly a believer's love and gratitude to Christ for what he has accomplished in redemption was written by a teenager. The author, William Ralph Featherstone, was born in July 23, 1846 in Montreal, Canada, son of John and Mary Featherstone. The family were members of the Wesleyan Methodist Church of Montreal. It is thought that the young Featherstone penned these words at a time of his conversion experience when only 16 years of age. Though information about William Featherstone is scarce, it is believed that he then sent the text to his aunt, Mrs. E. Featherstone Wilson, living in Los Angeles, who in turn encouraged his publication. It is reported that the original copy of the poem in the author's boyish handwriting is still cherished treasure in the family. <clears throat> when studying the backgrounds behind our enduring hymns, such as My Jesus, I Love Thee, one never ceases to marvel at the workings of God in bringing together the necessary circumstances that make possible the birth and preservation of expressions such as these, which believers in every generation and culture can employ in their praise and adoration of God and the Lord Jesus. 
My Jesus, I love Thee, I know Thou art mine. For Thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art Thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis thou. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus is now. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore thee. In heaven so bright, I'll sing with the glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus is now. Like a 16 year old's heart to, to get wow. out. <laughs> Pam, are you crying again? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wept a lot tonight. All these stories, they just get to my heart. Mm. Good. Yeah, that's a, these stories about these hymns are amazing. Hey, thanks everybody for sharing tonight um, and the prayers and just a very lovely night and um pat i understand why you stay up really late <laughs> it's really it's really cool jeffrey all thank yours. you david Welcome. and hi everybody um wonderful song i i just think that if 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 jesus christ can work in the heart of a teenager and he can work in the heart of uh, a downer, an outer, an addict that was on Facebook today that you saw, Carol. Um, and he works in the hearts of each one of the people, each one of us he can work with. Uh, speaking by himself, he can work with old guys. He can work and get to the heart of everyone. Um, what a wonderful savior it is. What a wonderful Savior, and one that we can love with all our heart. So, well, tonight we're picking up our journey in uh, the book of Galatians, and tonight we pick up in chapter 5, and um, this is a new section. So, while you're turning there, we can talk a little bit about it. This could be we could label this many things, but one of the things this section could be labeled is... Hey Jeff? Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, before you jump there, could you just talk about why you're covering half the book, or why the half the chapter tonight, and what your desire is relative to the interaction? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. So, so tonight we're uh, going to pick up or uh, uh, work with the first half of the chapter, Galatians chapter 5. We're doing that because we love the interaction, where we want the interaction, and um, with with a group this size, uh, we think smaller bites get us more of that. So uh, as we get there tonight, you know, we we want uh, if you have questions, if you have insights, if you have comments, um, speak up. And I'd also just say. Um, just, just chime in. Say, hey, Jeff. Hey, David. Hey, Jerry. Hey, John. Hey, somebody to speak <laughs> up. Because there's enough voices and different pages that we might not see it. So just speak up. We'll do the best we can. But 
one of the great things about this fellowship is the interaction, uh, which we really enjoy. So anything else you want to add on that, David? No, bro. I was just, I think the conversation was we've loved it. We almost tried to do a felt, uh, meeting on Monday night. We just couldn't get it organized to even go back to the stuff Jerry had done in the second piece because on the cake, I think you guys called it that. Um, so, um, but part of the conversation really was, uh, you know, I said to Jeff after the meeting, I said, I loved Galatians 4. I love, I felt like when Jeff finished, I had already eaten dessert and then Jerry started and I had another meal coming. <laughs> it was like, how much can I get? And then I, it's just everybody stayed. So we just talked about how do we, you know, keep the tempo, but also provide the interaction. And then Jeff and Jerry talked and they made this decision. Um, so, and Jeff told me about it tonight. He just thought it was kind of cool that they decided to take smaller bites to provide the opportunity for dialogue. So I thought that was pretty cool. Amen. Amen. Thanks, David. Thank you. So, so this section, this third section, um, which actually is chapter five, and it goes most of the way through chapter six also, it could be called, or a, a title for this section could be, The Call to Godly Living. So I think for some of us that have looked at other epistles, Ephesians or Romans, and we look at a doctrinal side and a practical side, well, this is moving to the practical side. It's a call to godly living. And, and um, so far, if we kind of briefly summarize, so far, Paul has reached sort of two important goals in his letter to the Galatians or we could even call it his appeal to the Galatian believers. First was he defended his apostleship, including his right to preach the gospel, regardless of whether he had the support of uh, human authorities or not. And that's really what chapters one and two were all about. Secondly, he defended the gospel itself. So first was his right to preach the gospel, but the second thing he defended was the gospel itself and, and really showing that it's by the faith of Jesus Christ that we, that Christians, are freed, and it's apart from the law. We're freed from the curse of the law, and we are declared righteous, so we're brought into a right relationship with God. And that's really what chapters 3 and 4 have been about. So before plunging into this next section, verse 1 of chapter 5 is a tremendous verse because Paul kind of, uh, it, it, to introduce this section of the letter, he interjects a verse that, it, that could be viewed as a summary of everything that's gone before and a transition to what follows. So some have viewed this really actually as the key verse in the epistle of Galatians is this Galatians 5.1. And it's really got two parts to it because there is part of it is a, it's a, it's a declaration of Christ's purpose in saving us. In other words, what it's all about. But it's also an appeal based upon that purpose. So let's take a look. Chapter 5, verse 1, I'm reading tonight from the REV, and it says, For living in freedom, Christ has set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of bondage. Okay. If I were to, if I were, um, if I were to try and uh, say these 15 verses in six words, in other words, trying to summarize them. Let's see if there, it's not six, maybe seven or eight words. Here's a, here's a, here would be a brief summary. It would be not legalism, not license, but law of love. That's what we'll be talking about tonight. It's not legalism. It's not license, but it's the law of love that we've been called to. So what he says is living in freedom. So if you remember last week where Jerry left off with the allegory, the allegory was all about slavery and freedom. Chapter 4 was really all about slavery and freedom. And, he, and so he says now, living in freedom. Remember, we are children 
of the free woman, and therefore living in freedom, Christ has set us free. Paul has spent two chapters making the argument, setting the defense, making the point that we have been freed from the law, the Torah, and all of that system, Christ has set us free. And the exhortation is, therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of bondage. Don't go back to it. So um, living in freedom is, is um, it's liberty, it's, it's freedom, it's um, freedom, it's freedom as a contrast to the Mosaic law, which has been compared and continues to be compared to slavery. We have been set free. So we've been set free from the domination or the freedom again from the Mosaic law as the way of salvation and so on. So then it says keep standing firm, which is, is to be firmly committed to this. So he's make, if he makes the point that in living in freedom, Christ has set us free, then stand firm in that. Let's be committed, firmly committed, or uh, in it, having conviction around Christ setting us free. And the one thing he says is, don't be subject again to the yoke or a yoke of slavery. Um, Yoke is a, is a Jewish expression, very ju common Jewish expression. Um, it's often used of, uh, where they talk about taking the yoke of the law upon oneself. So the Jews, the Jews actually took it as a, it was an honor. They would take the law upon themselves. They would take that yoke upon themselves. So it was actually a, a good thing. But Paul compares it to slavery. Because he says, don't go back and take that yoke, that the oppressive nature, um, the, the imposition of the yoke, don't take that. He considers it to be slavery. So, again, this transition verse, he's kind of summarized what we have, which is freedom in Christ. Um, he's brought up the basically two systems for being made right in a right relationship with God, and he's propounding salvation by faith in Jesus Christ and the freedom there, and let's not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. And now we're off into the section about how do we do that, and what's it like to live in a godly way. We'll take this by section. So I'm going to read the section and then uh, tee it up to Jerry here, and we'll get some insight around this. So what he says is, listen, I, Paul, say to you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. I testify again to every man who gives himself circumcised that he is obligated to do the whole law. You have cut yourselves off from Christ who are seeking to be declared righteous by the law. You have fallen from grace. For by the Spirit and based on our trust, we eagerly wait for the righteousness for which we hope. For in union with Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value, but what matters is trust working through love. Okay. So, Jerry, we're off and running. So, talk to us a little bit. Of what's this section all about? What are your thoughts here? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. And that was, that was a, um, a great way to enter into this new uh, part of the letter. And uh, one thing just to add is the, this idea of freedom is, is really important. Uh, and Paul will revisit it later on. Um, it had become front and center in verse 13 specifically. And, and freedom for Paul, it's important to understand that it's not freedom in the sense of unrestrictive autonomy or things like that. This is freedom from the demands of being under the law. And while Paul paints this very negative caricature of, of the law, he, he doesn't have a negative view of the law itself. He's painting this caricature or this, 
this rhetorical image of the way that law is like the law was like slavery um, in order to oppose the way that these uh, Judaizers, these Jewish Christian agitators were trying to bring that uh, the law into the gospel. And so he's, 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 he's a lot of this is rhetorical flair. Uh, because he, Paul, um, speaks very highly of the law elsewhere and speaks of it being holy, just, and good and um, something divinely given by God. And so it's not that there's anything wrong with the law in and of itself. Even back in chapter 3, Paul talks about the law in very positive terms in the way that it brought uh, his people up to the point of which uh, he had, the Father had set God of when he was going to send his son, uh, the Messiah. So let's just keep in mind here that freedom is referring to being out from underneath of that program of the uh, Sinaitic legislation through the covenant God made with Moses and the people of Israel. So now we get to uh, verse two here and Paul starts off with this really interesting uh, exclamation here of like, he says, listen, and this is a Greek word that is commonly translated or understood elsewhere um, in the gospels that uh, Jesus uses it often uh, usually translated behold or look. And uh, this uh, imperative here of, it's from a Greek word meaning to, to actually look at, um, is to arrest the attention of the audience to that there's something coming after this that's very important to pay attention to. And even to add on to that a second tier, Paul uses um, himself, he says, I, Paul, and this is like him set, giving a personal affidavit. It's like he's undersigning what he's going to say with his own name, and which brings in his apostolic authority and everything that his, uh, he stands for in his ministry uh, in the proclamation of the gospel. And he talks here about circumcision. And this comes uh, to be the actual root of the issue really. So back in chapters, um, in chapter three and in chapter four, when we're talking about works of the law and things like that um, relating to uh, dietary restrictions, uh, holy day and festival observance and, and other things, circumcision is like the quintessential, it is like the work of the law that defines Jewishness, that to be a Jew, you had to be circumcised. And so he brings that into, into the foreplay of his argument right now. I'm sorry, the forefront of his argument right now. And uh, addresses that if the Gentile uh, Christian believers at Galatia, because this is who it refers to, because the, the Jewish believers in Galatia would already be circumcised. So he's really kind of bringing out the uh, Gentile Christian believers in Galatia that if they are persuaded by these agitators uh, with their uh, law-abiding gospel, um, that they go and they get circumcised, which is kind of like putting the nail in the coffin on, on following the law. And actually in Jewish eyes, when somebody um, became circumcised uh, in order to like became a proselyte and then circumcised, that was like, that was the final step in becoming fully Jewish and being bound and obligated to observe Torah and live the Jewish lifestyle. And so Paul's saying that if you guys go down that road to that, you know, and, and have that done to you, he says, and this is really just very uh, stark words, that Christ will be of no benefit. And it's so interesting here that he's using this word, um, the benefit. It's like, uh, it's a Greek word meaning of profit or of value. That he's basically saying getting circumcised, which is to embrace this law-abiding gospel of the Judaizers, that that makes Christ's work null and void. And this is very similar to what he said back in uh, the end of chapter 2. Um, he says in 21, 221, I do not reject the grace of God, for if righteousness is through the law, uh, remember that the law was given graciously by God as a form of God's grace in his covenant with the Israelites. And if righteousness is found through that means, he says, Christ died for nothing. So here Paul is picking up that theme that if you guys are going to be depending upon the law, he's saying, then, then Christ is, is of no value. 
Christ doesn't, Christ does not benefit or profit you anything. And verse three, he kind of testifies. He says, he kind of gives a, a reiteration. I testify again to every man who gets himself circumcised uh, that he is obligated to do the whole law. Now, this is like a little word play in the Greek here where obligated is a, is a very similar sounding word to the word benefit. Um, one is, uh, let's see, I got a note written down here somewhere, I think. Um, yeah. So benefit is ophelese, and uh, to be obligated is ophelates. And they're very similar sounding words, but it, they play off of each other that if the Galatians get circumcised, Christ will not benefit them. Instead, they will be in debt rather than being in, in a benefit. And that, rather than being beneficiaries, they will be debtors. They will be in debt to do the law. And this idea of uh, doing the, doing the uh, whole law here is, as I was saying, in Jewish eyes, that's kind of the just uh, probably best the way that I see it, Paul is describing the need for somebody who goes to get circumcised and depends upon Torah observance, that it's not that they just get circumcised that one thing and, that, and that's it. It's that uh, circumcision is just basically entry into an entire way of life. That they are, if they're going for circumcision, it's, it's that they're going to actually transition into an entire Jewish identity. And they're going to they're going to be depending upon an identity marker as uh, as becoming a Jew, in a way that then they lose their entire Gentileness. They lose their Gentile identity, because he's saying if you get circumcised, you actually need to observe the entire Torah, the entire law of God, and that is basically what sets somebody out as being Jewish, as being part of the Israelite nation through whom God made this covenant. But as we talked about before, this is a different covenant than the Abrahamic one. And the mistake the Jews were making was thinking that the Mosaic covenant with Israel was the extension and fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. And as we looked back in chapter three, Paul disproves that whole premise, specifically with the temporal argument of that the law came 430 years after God made the covenant with Abraham. And Abraham wasn't even circumcised when, he, when the covenant was made with him. So circumcision has nothing to do with the Abrahamic covenant. But in the Jews' eyes, it had everything to do with the Abrahamic covenant. Now in verse 4, he, he even intensifies this issue. So he gives a, a hypothetical premise that if you let yourselves be circumcised, if you get circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit. Now he gives allegations on somebody, if you, if you would. So for the sake of the argument, the conditional sentence implies the reality of, of the condition. That So if you're circumcised, verse 4, you have cut yourself off from Christ, you who are seeking to be declared righteous by the law. Now, there's two things here. He has a, a claim about the, the consequence of this. But then he also addresses the people's attitude and heart, those that are seeking to be justified or declared righteous by the law. That, that's a kind of a shorthand for like by works of the law, which Paul has been talking about all along, uh, which would be a reliance upon the Torah and the covenant that was made with Moses and finding yourself identified as God's people through that means, through keeping Torah, which would be uh, adopting a, a Jewish uh, identity. Um, the consequence he puts here in such grave terms is you have cut yourself off from Christ. Now, Paul didn't actually bring up the idea of um, Christ in terms of slavery uh, and the contrast there uh, together up until this point now, which he's bringing forward. It's always been about trusting in Christ. And it's been about the promise uh, in Christ, the true seed of Abraham, against um, reliance upon law and works of the law and uh, keeping Torah. Now, this, this strong language here is he's trying to point out that the, um, the power of the truth of the gospel, so the power of that is found in Christ, that by only trusting in Christ, 
can one effectively receive the righteousness that they desire in order to receive the promised blessings that God gave to Abraham. And so what he's saying is that if you supplant your trust in Christ with dependence upon the law, upon Jewish, uh, upon being Jewish, upon finding yourself within the covenant uh, parameters of the Mosaic legislation, he's saying you've been cut off or you have cut yourself off from Christ. This uh, cut yourself Jerry? off. I'm sorry, did somebody say something? May I? This is Carol Tittle. Um, it seems interesting to me that Paul is using the term cut off from Christ in the same context as he's talking about circumcision. <laughs> yeah, well, um, actually, let me explain that because they're actually not related um, in the Greek. Uh, the, the idea of getting cut off from Christ, the, the term there, um, I believe it's katargeo, it uh, refers to something that is abolished or destroyed uh, and sometimes carries the nuance. Of okay, so it's not like cut out? Uh, no, it's, it's not like right. to actually cut or what's the other word for cut? Uh, kopto, I think. It's, it's not that, those words. This means to actually to destroy or abolish. And, and this is a point I was leading to because th this is how strong this language is. Is Paul is, he uses this language in, in only elsewhere in this particular um, syntactical construction in Romans 7, uh, where he talks about being released from the law. He uses the analogy of, of marriage in the way that uh, when somebody dies, they're released from their husband, where he says that you've been released from the law by the death of Christ. And so the release from the law is that same term in the syntactical construction there. Uh, and so the, this language is so strong because he's basically saying, if you choose to depend upon the law, you're abolishing your connection with Christ. He's saying you are severing it. I don't know if there's any other stronger way you can, you can basically try and point this dichotomy out. Uh, this is like definitely um, Paul is, is pulling all the stops out, um, not holding any punches. He's laying down the bottom line here. And so then later on at the end of verse four, he says, you have fallen away from grace. And this is actually a uh, reiter. I'm sorry, somebody say something? No, I was thinking something, though. Oh, uh, do you, <laughs> you, you want to uh, say something right now, David? Yeah, and you may come back to Jerry, but this interesting Romans 5, is it Romans 8 that says, nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ, compared to this, which is laying it out. And I'm wondering if there's a figure of some sort, because... I mean, you look at this, it's like the argument to your point, and he's done this several times, you know, as he did, I forget, at the beginning of this, what, you know, the, was it the questions in chapter three or four? I forget, I forget the, the four or five rhetorical questions. He's no longer being rhetorical. He's now like, okay. And like to literally say, um, you've been alienated, you've fallen from grace, um, this thing of the first one, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Now, I mean, that's, what is that? <laughs> we still have Holy Spirit. Is that, you know, so what is, what is that? That's like, how, how is it that that could be? So is it figuratively? Well, that's what I was thinking. Sure, sure. And, uh, and that's a good question. Um, and I'll say that there's, there's, a, uh, there's two things. This is a, uh, there's what Paul is trying to accomplish by writing this. And then there are what you could say the theological implications or right. um, interpolations from it. Right. Um, I can definitely answer the first one. The second one I think is, is a, a lot more involved and would require a much more highly nuanced conversation. Okay. So the first one is that Paul is trying to accomplish in, in his audience's mind, first of all, the danger. Uh, he, he, like, you can definitely see that, that um, while he's not being rhetorical in the sense of just saying things for the sake of them, he's being um, rhetorical in the sense of he's trying to be persuasive. And the reason by being persuasive is that he's basically going to be declaring the severity of the mistake 
of this false gospel. I mean, even at the beginning of the letter, he, he really uses strong language about people who are preaching a false gospel. I mean, he's talking about these Jewish Christian, these Christians, these Christians who are preaching this gospel that's contrary to his, he says that they should be accursed, accursed. You know what I mean? So like, uh, I mean, we, we don't see anywhere else in scripture that you're supposed to curse your fellow brothers and sisters, but he's talking about fellow brothers and sisters here who are bringing into the church a false gospel, um, a, I guess you could say it, a heretical gospel, a gospel that's contrary to the one that he brings, which preaches Christ. So basically what he's saying is these, uh, these Jewish Christians who are trying to bring in uh, this gospel that depends upon law identity, depends upon becoming Jewish and coming under the covenant um, uh, of Israel, that that is actually something completely against Christ. And so uh, I definitely see him marking out very, um, in, in very black and white lines, the harm involved in embracing this, this false gospel of, of the Judaizers. Yep, and, and Jerry, I'll, I think I'll wait and come back as well, because you, got, you have the word value. I'm assuming it's the same word. I haven't checked the interlinear. Uh, there are two as it is in six. Because well, Christ will be of no value to you at all in six, circumcision and uncircumcision has no value. Um, can I say something? Sure. Yeah, go ahead, Mina. Um, I always thought, I mean, it, isn't it connection where the gospel is exposed to salvation? You know, the, he says, I'm not ashamed of gospel because it has power of, you know, yeah, um, uh, Roman, Romans 1.16, right? Yeah, so when it comes to, I mean, when it, you're dealing with the gospel it, and the salvation, so I don't, could, could it be not talking about after you got saved and then not going to, I mean, if you think you're going to get saved by doing circumcision and all that, Christ will be no effect. Is that what? Well, and, and that's also a good question because we see him addressing here, he's addressing the Christian believers uh, in Galatia. So these, uh, his audience is, is already Christian. But, they are, but they, Yeah, but the Christians trying to preach unbelievers too. I'm trying to get other ones saved too. So, you know what I mean? I mean, if you start thinking saving people by circumcision, you know. He's basically saying that that's that's not a, available. Like, for the, whoops. What, what, oh, John, you say something? Yeah, I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, Mina, he really is talking to the Christians here, and the point is, they they it's like he said earlier in the chapter, they came to Christ by faith, and yet now it's like they're trying to be perfected by the law, and what you're dealing with here. You've got to keep this in the context of what they're trying to do. It's like, well, we got saved by faith, and then that natural thing works up inside you where, oh, I haven't done enough. I need to do more. Um, maybe, maybe there's more I could do that would make me a better standing. And that's where he makes things. He says, like, you know, if you if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. It's not saying Christ isn't any benefit. Obviously. We have Holy Spirit, we have the permanence of salvation, but the freedom, back to verse one, the freedom that we have from the law, we all of a sudden we want to be circumcised, the, the benefit of being free, we're not free anymore. So Christ is of no benefit in the context of you had a choice to live in freedom and now you're not doing it. And the same thing with the cut off, it it is lexically not the same word, but it like like Jerry said, the essence of it is destroyed or severed, and so it it is a subtle wordplay. It's not a wordplay semantically, but it's a wordplay in meaning, where you've been you cut yourself off from with your foreskin, and now you're destroyed, severed, cut off from Christ. So it's it's not a lexical or semantic wordplay, but it is a wordplay in meaning. Uh, circumcision versus cut off and then and then basically the value the word value Jerry and I played with this for a while but it value was one way of saying it 
Um, it's really, it's the iskus is the Greek word, it's strength. Um, but, you know, how does, what, what's it mean by strength? The circumcision doesn't have any strength, it doesn't have any value, it doesn't have any purpose. Uh, why? Because really what matters is how you got here in the first place. Trust, working through love. So that's, it, it's, it's really, uh, he's talking to the Christians and he's saying, guys, it, it, Christ is enough. He did it all. You trusted. You made it. Why are you trying to do more? Christ, you're, you're going to lose that wonderful benefit. Can, can I jump in there, John? Yeah. We were talking about this earlier on my drive home. I love chapter 5, verse 1, because, and because it does start that transition. And he says, you know, this verse is used many times by um, uh, other Christians to show that, well, we that believe that we are saved— that we are saved eternally, that nothing can change that, gives us a license to sin. And that's not what this word freedom is indicating. It's not that we're free to do whatever the heck we want to do. What he's saying is Christ set us free, free, free to, not free from what, it does indicate that, but free to do what? Free to now love God without having to, free to love God the way that he has always desired us to do. We are now free to absolutely love him and obey him and walk with him and talk with him because we want to. And it summarizes that in verse six, but trust working through love, not trust working through uh, rules, not trust working through laws, not trust working through have to, not trust working to you better do this or that. It's trust working through our love for him. That's why we were set free. That's why Christ set us free. It, it kind of, the, the con, immediate context starts with that freedom that Christ has set us free for and summarize and closes with that trust working through the love that we have for God. I mean, that's what I really see in this context. I may be way off, but that's my two cents. Yeah, I was thinking about, um, we're talking about the leanings of religious tendencies, and of course I'm stretching it a little bit here for purpose and for insight, but you know, when uh, Peter was stumbling over the vision that he had about, you know, the sheet with the animals on it, you know, his Jewish, leanings and tendencies showed up in that he was offended, you know, by the vision. And then the Lord kind of had to stress, you know, get him out of that mindset because he was so used to the food regulations of the, the kosher food. It's a, it's a great example of thinking about religious tendencies, you know, and the law and going back to that for acceptability or the Jewish, you know, their, their, um, you know, their, their identification, you know, as what, well, you know, we're the set apart people, you know, the elitism in that. And I was just thinking about Peter must have wrestled with coming out of his Jewishness as the Lord had to work with them to transition from, you know, his former religious habits as a Jewish man. I, that just came to my mind with, you know, some insight here of, you know, wrestling against that, um, you know, what you did before that you thought, you, you know, what you had to do before. And of course, you know, the mosaic law there is involved. But I just thought about that Peter's tendency and that he was Jewish and he did wrestle against the kosher foods and whatnot. And he screwed up there too, you know, um, in the fear that he had, you know, going back and forth, uh, you know, nonsense, you know, peer pressure <laughs> stuff about the, the, the kosher regulations of food. Um, uh, so he wrestled with that, you know, I suppose he got delivered in the end, <laughs> but, um, cause he went on, you know, to share, you know, the truth about, uh, Jesus Christ and, uh, you know, laid all that aside, but that's just good insight about the religiosity uh, where they were so used to practicing that, um, the Torah and the, their Jewish ID, you know, which made them the elite, you know, um, so just thinking that thing through, you know, um, 
you know, even our own lives. And I was a Catholic. And if I didn't do the Stations of the Cross and the Rosaries, man, I'll tell you what, you know, it was hard throwing those rosary beads away. And um, no, seriously, you know, I hung out with the nuns and I was doing all kinds of stuff, wearing hats and good Lord, I was jumping through more hoops than you could ever imagine to get God to love me. And, and it was real for me. You know, I was, man, I'll tell you, I was like a lunatic with the Catholicism. And it, I was just so compelled to understand, you know, God love me. Do you love me? Do you love me? And just this compulsion and this, you know, this, you just believe whatever, you know, you're told until you come to a place of conversion in Christ Jesus and can give all that up. And I remember the Lord working with me and he said, you can, you can, please don't anybody be offended by what I'm about to say. When he just worked in me and he said, I want you to give these rosary beads up. You know, you, what are you hanging on to this stuff for? And pendulance, and I had a Virgin Mary, you know, on my underwear. I'm serious, man. I was all beeps and whistles and saints and good Lord Jesus. You know, I was exhausted. Um, but, you know, when I came to Christ, there was such a freedom. But the, that tendency of, you know, is this real? You know, don't I have to do more? And um, the, just this overlaying of religious behavior that I had to get rid of all the way up until like a couple of years after I was born again, I still was doing some funky, crazy stuff, you know, and went back to the Catholic church and threw up because all of a sudden that incense was making me sick, you know, that, you know, they would have these, I don't know what you would call it now, but, um, you know, it started making me sick and I ran out of the church and um, had to go to a ladies room. And I thought, Lord, what is going on? It's like, you know, you're not getting anything out of this anymore. You know, you're rejecting your freedom. I just wanted to share that. With me. If there's any insight that you can pick apart, you know, the bones and, you know, eat the fish, um, please do so. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. Can I add one more, yeah. one more thing in there to, sure. uh, to, to, to go back to how Jeff started the evening about this section of Galatians, I believe, is about our walk our godly walk and what we're trying to do to be a more godly and more righteous. And in that verse that David was hung up there about, about being cut off from Christ, Jerry had explained before that it's the, it's the work and the accomplishments of Christ. We're not severing our relationship with Christ. His, his, his attitude toward us has not changed, but we're ignoring his accomplishments and his benefit that, because of the, that work that he did, righteousness is by faith in that, what he did. And it's not by what we're doing. If we're still trying to work to become more godly and more righteous, then we just have, have forsaken all of that work that he did. So we're not really cutting I mean, I, that makes more sense to me when I think of it like Jerry explained it, that we're cutting ourselves off from the, from the work of Christ or the accomplishments. And the benefits. Amen. Thank you, Doug. Michelle? <laughs> Yeah, one of the things that hit me as I was reading this section, and I don't know, you know, also if it's quite relevant or not, but I, I really like process. And that, you know, when you have like a new person come into an organization, having process is a kind of helps them to be able to, you know, blend into the culture to blend into you know how we're going to get our work done and such like that but when you have seasoned employees that sometimes process can limit them from being able to do the right thing because there might not be a process step for that and yet they know the goal so well that bypassing the process is a more efficient, better way to meet the goals of the organization. And so there's a wisdom in being able to bypass that process when it's put in the hands of a mature person, you know, who really understands the, you know, the heart and the goal of what we're trying to do. And that I kind of see this parallel, you know, where with, with the law that it kind of, you know, there's a place where it talks about it being your tutor, you know, until you're mature enough. And that the law did kind of have so many good things that, you know, kind of helped people to, you know, start to align themselves with God's heart. But that now that Christ has like given us a jump, you know, into maturity, that 
it isn't so good to be tied to that old process anymore that in order to be effective, you know, we have to be able to put that behind us and now just operate with the mission and the culture of the team and go forward based on that. Yeah, it's well, I love that analogy, Michelle, because one of the ways I, I think Jerry and others have described what we're talking about here is that it is two different systems would be the word that that's been used and and the systems being the means by which you get the inheritance or get into um, the inheritance of the Abrahamic covenant. And there are two different systems. And the one system we're all talking about that we're in is by faith in, in Jesus Christ, by trust in Jesus Christ. The other system, if it ever worked, which actually it didn't in the Mosaic Law, but it doesn't work anymore, that's a broken system. That will not get people into the inheritance of the Abrahamic covenant. So it is, it's these dual systems here. So great, great thoughts there, everyone. Jerry, before we move on to the next section, any additional thoughts in verses five and six there? Well, let me, I think, um, yeah, let me finish up the end of verse four here real quick. Okay. Um, it's also another powerful uh, statement where Paul says, you have fallen away from grace. And, and this is actually a, just a reiteration. He's using a, a different metaphor to describe the same reality. You know, he's, he's talking about being cut off from Christ, and really it's, it's two spheres. There's the sphere of law, and there's the sphere of Christ. And, he's, and it comes down to the means, as Jeff was saying, of how the person, the believer, is trying to find themselves within the, the right sphere that will grant them to be an heir of the inheritance, a, a rightful heir, a child of Abraham. And so Paul is talking about this grace. He's already talking about the grace that was given through the law back in the end of chapter 2. This grace here is, is particularly referring to the accomplished work of Christ in his life and death and resurrection. And that to go back to law or to Torah keeping as the way to find yourself back, uh, as a way to find yourself within the Abrahamic covenant and the way you identify as a child of Abraham, which most Jews did see things that way was that to be a child of Abraham was to be Jewish and to be under the law. Paul's saying, if you go back to that system, you are leaving the grace that is found in Christ, that you want to be free. You want to experience the promised spirit and everything that he says, they, you find that in Christ. And then, and so to fall away, this metaphor of sort of like just uh, departing that to do that, to go back to law is to, is to depart and to leave and to go away from the sphere of finding the inheritance in Christ. So he's just reiterating again the idea that if you go and you depend upon law, you've left, you've abolished the idea of finding that freedom and, the, and everything that goes along with being in Christ and that sphere of living. So it's just a, another way of saying the same thing. Uh, Jerry, Jerry, with that in mind, too, as I understand it, um, that word fallen is, it means to change for the worse from a favorable condition. And so in this case, it sounds like what you're saying, that the favorable condition was grace and everything that, that they had. They're actually changing for the worse. They're going from a favorable condition of grace and Christ to the condition of the law that you've been describing yeah def definitely it's kind of like you're you're standing upright and then you're you're face down on the ground yeah <laughs> i mean which one which one do you which one has more mobility you know which one um uh, allows you the freedom to like uh i, I think um, who was saying it might have been dennis you know in, the freedom in christ as we will get to in verse 13 is all about living and becoming the person god desires and has destined you to be as his as his child um and so we'll, we'll get to a little bit more about what freedom means then but do you want to do you want us to kind of uh continue on in verse five and six here to find to round out this section yeah yeah okay. what else what's what's there in five and six 
Yeah, so Paul changes in verse 5 to now give, uh, he starts with this conjunction for, it's a common Greek conjunction giving an explanation uh, or, or more like the cause for how come he just claimed something. And also keep in mind that Paul is not actually claiming the Galatian believers uh, are, in, are currently involved in being cut off from Christ or falling from grace. This is, this is a part of the conditionality of the sentence that this is a hypothetical given that if you get circumcised, these are the consequences. So now he follows up with, well, so if it's not, if it's not law, but it's, uh, he says, by the Spirit and based on our trust. So he, he's, he's now contrasting the dependence upon circumcision and works of law and Jewish identity with the Spirit and trust or faith. And that by those and based on those two things, which has been a major theme throughout the entire letter, he says, for it's by these things, not circumcision of the law, it's by the promised spirit we've received, which we've gained based upon our trust in Christ and the gospel, you know, through the gospel I preached about him. Paul, you know, obviously Paul is the first person narrator here. He's, he says, now we eagerly wait. Now this is a little bit of a switch because he's been talking more about a, the um, present state, uh, or I say present reception of a right standing with God or being declared righteous uh, before God. But here he now changes and, and looks forward. Um, this eagerly wait, this anticipation, he's saying that it's by the Spirit and by our trust that we are awaiting righteousness for which we hope. And so this is a big shift in Paul. And uh, from what I see here is he's basically saying that uh, the righteous uh, righteousness that the Galatian believers have, that it, they've, they've received the proof through the Spirit, and they've received it based upon their trust in Christ or their faith, that this, is a, this enables them. It's part of the process of which they are on a trajectory to the, the eschaton, the end times, of which ultimately righteousness will, it's like there's, you know, there's the present righteousness, which is uh, more of what we call a forensic righteousness, where um, we have a certain particular relationship with God. But then the righteousness, which Paul also uses, as we've talked about in the letter, is a, is a covenant category of being God, part of God's people. And if you're part of God's people, then you're going to be receiving the blessings that God has promised to Abraham. And that's what this whole thing is about. This whole thing is about being a child of Abraham, which is finding yourself within the Abrahamic covenant, which makes you a rightful heir of the inheritance. And that is what salvation is. is it's all of this wrapped up. And righteousness is the, the term Paul uses to describe somebody who is within the covenant community who is a rightful heir and child of Abraham. And so he's bringing all this together, saying that it's by the spirit and based on the trust that that righteousness is awaiting us. And that's the righteousness that we hope to achieve and he's and from he doesn't say it here, but implicitly, I think he's basically just talking about the return of Christ. He's talking about when the Lord returns, the hope that we have that is based upon the return of Christ, that we will be having the righteousness, that we will we'll be able to receive the inheritance that God has promised. And that's why in verse six he says, For in union with Christ, Jesus, it, it's not circumcision, and it's not uncircumcision. Because uh, these things that uh, basically the Jews looked at as being important identity markers to mark somebody out as being part of God's covenant people and, or not, that he's saying it's in Christ that is what matters. And in Christ, these identity markers are no longer at play. This is part of the old system. This is part of the former way that God was working through his people to bring them to the point of finding a, uh, all, everybody coming together and being united as a child of Abraham through the true seed of Abraham, who is Christ. And then he tags on at the end, rather than the idea of, is it circumcision or uncircumcision? Is it law keeping, you know, observing Torah or, or not? It, it, it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile. What matters, Paul says at the end of verse six, is trust or faith 
working through love. And so he brings everything back to trust and faith, but now he extends it. And he, he talks about the way that it's not just trust. It it's, has trust that is actually worked out and demonstrated through love. And this is a theme that he's going to now expand upon in the next section. But I like what uh, I think Doug was saying, if I remember right, uh, it's that the, the way that uh, love is, is going to be part of the undergirding of what it means to truly trust in Christ and live in Christ, uh, that's going to be the, the focus of Paul in this next section as he brings out. So it's kind of like he's transitioning his themes. He's been, it's been law, it's been slavery and freedom, then freedom, slavery, law, trust, trust to love. And this is going to be now the practical, a much more practical dimension for the Galatian believers. So Jeff, if you'll lead us into the, the next section here. Amen. And turn it back over to you. And, and this, um, as Jerry said, this trust working through love, he's about to tee up, if you will, a major, major theme of living a godly life. How do we take everything we've, we've done and um, put it together? One other thing just to bring up, if you notice in verses 5 and 6, Paul brings up hope and faith and love, or hope and trust and love. And so these are themes we think about in Corinthians and other places. But I just want to bring up, he brings it up right here in Galatians in this first letter as well, which is tying in these, these tremendous Christian concepts, if you will, of hate, of, of hope, and trust, and love. Hey, Jeff? Yes. Um, uh, I wanted to see if there's anybody who wanted to uh, offer any input. I also, David, was noticing the time. Um, maybe we could have some conversation about this, the end of this section, and I don't know what you wanna, where you want to go from here. Yeah, I, I think, actually, to your point, Jerry, I do think it's, it's seven after nine. I think we tee it back to David. <laughs> Uh, I, have a, I have a question, if, if we're going to talk a little bit more. Can I have a question? Doug, yeah, Doug, Doug, absolutely. Jerry. But I think we're not doing questions anymore, Doug. You had your shot. Sandy Schroeder. <laughs> <laughs> One and done for the Campbell family. Well, you're hard. You're <laughs> hard. <laughs> That's <laughs> tough, yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> Doug, uh, so just first process check. Um, I'm great. Like, I'm for me, I'm sitting here going, eh, yeah, it's a little late. Who cares? Let's keep rolling. So that's kind of where I'm at, Doug. I'm happy to throw it to you. So, Jeff, if you guys throw it back here, I think, like, if, you know, we talk about this being an hour and a half. People want to hang, please do. Pat, is Pat still here? <laughs> Did Miss? Oh, my God. Look at that. Mr. Ireland is still with us. Wow. Yeah. God, bless, God bless you, man. What's your you know, I mean, Pat, God, yeah, really. I mean, God bless you. So, um, if people would the like Irish, to. The people, Irish are tough. If people would like to drop, please feel free. Doug, let's go back to you. And I think I think Jeff has teed up to go spend some time in the next few chapters. I mean, the, just verse six could be. Let's just do verse six for the night, you know. But so the, it's a very rich section. Um, but Doug, can we go to you and then Jeff? Um, my my pitch would be let's keep rolling. Okay. Uh, so All Jerry, right. maybe you you could help me understand the the difference between the righteousness that we have now which you know, our, our, our sins have been paid for, we're redeemed, and you know, we generally sort of believe that we have this, this righteousness before God already. How is that different from the righteousness that we hope for? Mm. Go that, into that again for me, because I'm, I'm mixed up about that. Uh, sure, sure. Um, so Paul, a lot of times, has like this two-stage view of um, the the current age that we're in and the new age that's coming. And he oftentimes talks about aspects of, of experiencing the coming age in the present, but yet not its fullness and, and not the, the complete picture of what that entails. Uh, so when he talks about righteousness, the, the forensic, when I use the word forensic, it, they talk about being like judicial, like basically in a law court, having the ruling uh, be in your favor, acquitting you of, of the guilt of, of a crime or things like that. So um, uh, that, that is part of the picture. Uh, the other part of the picture with righteousness is that because of that acquittal of guilt, that's, that's, it's not just that 
uh, verdict alone, but it's that when you, because we have that verdict by our union with Christ, we stand in a certain relationship with God in Christ. And that relationship to God in Christ that we stand in is what makes us uh, children of Abraham. And because we're children of Abraham, the, the righteousness of being uh, that heir, we haven't received the inheritance of being an heir of Abraham. Like we, have, we haven't received that promise yet. That's part of the righteousness that, you, that we get by trusting or having faith in Christ. But that, that aspect of, the righteous, of, of being righteous, having righteousness, of what was promised to Abraham, that's still future. And so at the coming in the future, which we hope for the return of Christ, the, the, full, the fullness of being in a right relationship with God will come and will receive the entire inheritance that um, God has promised. Does that, does that make sense? Right. Yeah, he, Jerry, he said yeah, that helps. Not, he doesn't agree with anything you just said. I think that's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's like this, the phrase, already but not yet. Yeah, right, that's Jerry? a very common phrase to describe Paul's, yeah. you know, his, his view of how we currently have a lot of the, um, the realities of the coming age, but yet only in small little pieces and little glimpses and tastes. Even, um, you know, even the, uh, when we talk about having a, you know, a new life or eternal life, you know, we, we have, we, we, we received uh, a, a part of new life and we've received, received part of the, the power of the age to come. But as you still, I'm sure, are aware, we um, have a lot of problems with the old part of the, of the age where our flesh gets in our way. And that's the war that Paul talks about elsewhere between the flesh and the spirit and things like that. So it's like the, the problems of the current age um, conflicting with the uh, awesomeness of the coming age. So it's already here, but, but not quite yet. So question, hey, John Shanghai, you sleeping over there? Nope. Nope. Hey, so John, on a serious note, in the anchor, and if it's not there, you know, it'd be kind of cool, Doug, to follow up on your comment, to even have a chart, Jerry, that says, you know, he already, but not yet. And like the blessings of Abraham, like, so what happens in the inheritance that we, we have a token of, we don't have the full thing. So what do we got now? And when it shows up, what's the fullness of times bring? It'd be neat, like you, I could just see like literally a chart. Here are the six bullets of what we got now. We experience in part, we see it in part, but then here's what you get the whole thing when it all comes. It'd be neat to see that, you know, Doug, that's what, when you were talking, that's what went in my head was kind of like, okay, then show, let's see the distinction. I'm sure, John, you have it in a chart. In one of your I, I don't have it in the chart. I have it in the appendix on the permanence of salvation and the hope, the anchor of the soul. But there, you're right. I mean, for example, like Jerry was saying, You've got verses like Ephesians 2.8 that say we are saved. And then you've got verses like the one in Romans, I believe it's Romans 13, that says our salvation is closer than when we first believed. Or you've got verses that say we are redeemed. And then there are verses that say we're waiting for our redemption. Then you have verses that say we're going to be glorified. And then you've got verses like Romans 8 that says that we are already glorified. So the what what's being communicated there there is and this is where things get a little a little dicey we do have a peace like jerry said like the holy spirit we speak in tongues we you know we receive revelation we can do miracles um we we have a piece of what's coming in the fullness but that's but what we really have is a promise of salvation, a promise of redemption, a promise of glorification, a promise of being seated in the heavenlies, um, and and that kind of that promise of getting our new body. You know, Paul talks about you know my body is constantly being renewed and that kind of thing. But boy, then but well, we all know we get older. Look at my white beard, you know. And so we we have this promise that we're going to get a new body. So it is interesting. Uh, the, the tension back and forth, and that's where uh, Jerry, you might know. I don't, I don't know who coined the term. I know it's commonly used in theology. Already, not yet. That's a very common 
theological phrase that's particularly used in uh, Hebrew classes, because it's very clear in the Hebrew, much clearer in the Hebrew than it is in the Greek. So John, I'm gonna send you a, an email afterwards, and it'd be cool just to have a couple charts. Maybe we talk next week. Okay. Include blessings to Abraham. These are like, these are like four, four word questions that are 18 hour discussions, but it's okay. You're good, Shane Height, so I'm sure you'll get it. I'll send the note. Okay, Jeff, sorry. Back to the regularly scheduled program. Okay, so as is common with Paul, he brings up in that verse six again, he says what matters is trust working through love. He's gonna come back to that in a big way, which we get back in in verses 13, 14, 15, but he takes a sidestep, just like we often do. He takes a sidestep, and this is this section. So listen to the section, listen to the tone, and then uh, Jerry will help us sort through what's going on here. So verse seven, he says, he says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from the one who calls you. A little yeast leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you and the Lord that you will not think otherwise, but the one who is troubling you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. But I, brothers and sisters, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the stumbling block of the cross has been removed. I wish those who are stirring you up would castrate themselves. And by the way, Carol, you're going to get your word here <laughs> because it's going to come up this time in that word. So, so Jerry, uh, so what's going on here in this section? Yeah, Paul, he now turns to, to address uh, the Galatians here um, more along the lines of the way that he's, his concern for them and these... Uh, the opposition he's that uh, his gospel is receiving. And he brings up uh, this metaphor of running, which uh, Paul likes a lot to refer to the, the Christian walk. Uh, it happens in several places. Um, Philippians chapter 2 um, um, and elsewhere. <laughs> That's all off the top of my head. But um so he, he's like, you were doing well. You're running well. It's like you were on the trajectory um, with Christ as the, the basis for the righteousness that is promised to the seed of Abraham. And then he asks, well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? Now, this is, this is rhetorical because obviously uh, Paul knows exactly who's at fault here. You know, so he's not asking them a sincere question like, um, I'm not sure what's going on. Can you tell me who, who these people are who, you know, what, what, what happened? What, you know, what has derailed you? Now, he, he's using it for rhetorical effect. He's like, you were running. And actually, the, the Greek word used here for hindered is, is very interesting. It, it actually means to like kind of uh, one nuance is to cut in. And if you guys, I'm, I'm a runner. I've, I've been a lifelong runner. And when you're running a race, when somebody cuts in on you, it obstructs you from being able to, to run properly. And um, you do it intentionally because it's, it's a tactic, a strategy, kind of like in race car driving and things like that, in order to get in front of people and to prevent them from passing you. So Paul is in essence saying, you, you were running well. Who cut in on you while you were running to now prevent you or cause you not to be able to run the race that, that you're supposed to. Um, and this race you're supposed to is obedience to the truth, which is uh, Paul's way of saying the gospel that I shared with you concerning Christ and you trusting in that gospel in, in Christ and, and the accomplished work on the cross. In verse six, now he, he picks, he points out, he, he knows exactly what's going on. He's like this persuasion he doesn't really identify the people. He identifies their their talk, what they're uh, what they're pitching to the Galatians. He's saying this persuasion, the, this uh, this type of um, 
gospel that is, is you're being persuaded or enticed to embrace, um, it's not from the one who calls you. Now, this is interesting because this is kind of what Paul led off with back in, in chapter, uh, chapter one. Um, yeah, he's saying, um, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ. And this is that, that grace again from the previous section, uh, the particular grace that is found in, in the work of Christ. Um, that this, is, this persuasion of the false gospel, the reliance upon uh, Torah and everything, that this is not from the one who calls you. He's saying this isn't from God. And the, he follows up by now using an aphorism in verse 9. He says, a little yeast leavens the whole lump of dough. Now, it's kind of weird. He doesn't really talk about, he doesn't indicate how come he follows up with this sort of aphoristic saying um, uh, right after he just declared that the persuasion that the false gospel, that this thing that the Jewish Christian agitators are trying to promote, that it doesn't come from God. He says, a little yeast leavens the whole lump. Now, uh, you could think that this has connected with the uh, false teaching of, of this uh, false gospel, but it seems probably more likely because it's a, that the type of preaching that they were doing for this gospel is it's completely different. Paul says it's a complete change. The basis, the system upon which it's founded is completely different. So it's better probably to see here that the little yeast, that the yeast are representing the actual Jewish Christian agitators, the Judaizers. Now yeast uh, in Jewish eyes, um, Typically, if you study it in, in the Old Testament, it has a very negative connotation. And uh, especially like during Passover and everything, uh, they had to get rid of all the, the yeast um, from their house um, and eat unleavened bread and things like that. And, and so yeast has this um, sort of already preloaded notion in, uh, that it's, it's like bad, it's bad stuff even though obviously it's helpful for making bread and things like that. Uh, but Paul's aphorism here is basically saying a little bit of something bad, referring to the, if you allow these agitators, these Judaizers, uh, which uh, make up a minority, if you allow a little bit of bad in, he's saying that will spread. Just like yeast spreads throughout a, a lump of dough and causes the entire uh, dough to then ferment and, and uh, be leavened and everything. He's saying that if you allow these uh, people in, this persuasion from these, these uh, Jewish Christian agitators, then it'll end up just spreading and infecting the whole, uh, the whole group. And uh, he follows up in verse 10, though, with kind of like his counter. So like, he doesn't really tell them what to do about the, these Judaizers that are in the church. What he says is that I have confidence in you. He basically turns it now to his attitude and perspective toward the Galatians. He said, I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will not think otherwise. Now, why would he all of a sudden just turn to make a statement about what he thinks rather than what the Galatians should do to get rid of this yeast, the, uh, these uh, Judaizers, these Jewish Christians who are preaching this false gospel? Well, this is kind of like what's known as like an an epistolary confident, um, it's like an epistolary confidence formula. And it's sort of like, um, if you guys have ever been to like a sporting event and um, somebody's uh, maybe not doing, not performing so well, what, what do you do? Do you point out how many points they're down, how bad they're doing? No, you encourage them. You say, come on, you can do it. And that's kind of what Paul's doing here. He's basically saying, I have confidence in you guys. I mean, he's basically trying to give them a thumbs up saying, um, I'm supporting you. I'm cheering you on. I know you guys have it in you to do the right thing. And so he's, he's trying to uh, win them to understand uh, that uh, he is on their side trying to guide them on how to deal with this situation. Uh, Then uh, at the end there, it says, but the one troubling you will bear his judgment, whoever whoever he is. 
he's basically calling upon that, um, you know, he's not the one to be judging these outside, these uh, Jewish Christian agitators, that, that their judgment for, for preaching this false gospel is going to be upon them. And he, the last thing he says is whoever they are, he kind of like makes this indefinite, indefinite arbitrary claim. And it could be because he's trying to maybe demean their importance, or it could just be because he's just claiming that uh, he personally doesn't know who they are. He just knows of them because of the situation. Uh, but then he, he changes in verse 11 and he said, he now addresses them as brothers and sisters. And it seems the only reason why he's changing here is to try to refute an existing argument against him by these, uh, opponents of his that somehow they must have been accusing him that he was preaching circumcision, which would be, he's preaching that, uh, observing Torah was necessary in some contexts, but then here in Galatia, he was, he was not preaching that. So there had to have been some sort of accusation here he's refuting. He's saying, if I still preach circumcision, if I, de if I preach dependence upon uh, law, upon Jewishness, uh, then why am I being persecuted? And this is kind of like he's trying to undo by giving the illogicality of such a claim that he's being persecuted. And therefore, because he's being persecuted, he can't be preaching circumcision. So he's basically just trying to refute some sort of outstanding accusation that's in the air in, in the Galatians and uh, in, in the environment of the churches there. And if he was preaching circumcision, he says at the end of verse 11, he says that the stumbling block of the cross has been removed. Now this word stumbling block is kind of cool. It's, it's a, a Greek word that means something uh, that's, uh, that offends, uh, like uh, something that somebody uh, trips over and falls. Uh, it's, it's used in very rarely in secular uh, Greek literature to refer to a snare or a trap. And, but it's basically something that um, basically causes somebody to uh, be ensnared or trapped or offended. Um, and that's kind of what an offense is, is that you hear something that sort of just catches you and you get stuck on it and you can't let it go. And so what he's saying is that if I was preaching circumcision, if I was preaching this type of dependence upon Torah that uh, these Jewish Christian agitators are, then basically the offense of, of the cross of Christ is, is no longer in view. But in fact, that's, that's the opposite of what Christ, uh, what Paul is preaching here. He's preaching the cross of Christ, and that's why he's being persecuted. And so he basically is unraveling the entire illogicality of the accusation against him. But we're reading this into the text because Paul doesn't say why he's refuting this. He just does. So that, that's an important point to keep in mind. Now, what I like is how he rounds it out in verse 12 here with, okay, in, in, in spite of all this stuff and maybe this accusation that uh, has been levied against him, he's saying, I wish, this is my desire as Paul in dealing with all of these people and, and this, this issue um, that is undermining the truth of the gospel that I preach, that I wish that those who are stirring you up would castrate themselves. And this is probably one of Paul's most vehemently, uh, I would say, his most harsh, his most harsh uh, statement, I, I would say, probably in any of his letters, that he's basically um, saying, it's a kind of a play on words that, you know, these Jewish, agi uh, Jewish Christian agitators, the Judaizers were like talking about trying to convince the Galatians to undergo circumcision, you know, to so um, surgically removing the foreskin of, of their of their sex sex organ, you know, and so it's it's just a small little procedure. I mean, it's a big procedure, um, I, I think, for anybody. But um, now he's he's basically turning back and saying, people who are advocating for that small little uh, procedure, well, they should just go with it and hack the whole thing off. I mean, he, he's like they should emasculate Jerry. themselves. Who just said Jerry? Jerry, if they were actually, if they were actually Jewish, they would not be allowed in the temple anymore. <laughs> if they were, if they had been castrated, they wouldn't be allowed to go there. Uh, uh, yeah, and I and I don't so think he's talking to people who are. Yeah, I don't think to uh, people who are so ardent for the law, and trying to convince others that they should be 
spent um, observing the law, he's effectively saying, isn't he, that something should happen to them so that they can't even get to the temple. He's that dire about it. Oh, it's true that if somebody has their has a deformity or is a eunuch or things like that, that the law prohibits them from um, certain uh, options in in the ritual ser- uh, ritual worship at the temple and things like that. But I don't I don't know if he's really has that in mind here as much as he's just lashing back at at the opponents that he's dealing with and the way that they're trying to um, have this this fleshly uh, procedure done or this procedure in the flesh done to to his beloved brothers and sisters who he uh, won to the Lord through the gospel he preached and now they're trying to do this to them. He, he's basically, I think it's more like um, he's sort of uh, just in, in a flare of passion is declaring uh, sort of a, in a mockery that you know, they should just go ahead and castrate themselves. And yeah, I, think, I think we need to clarify. Well, you if, if you were a priest, if you were a child of Aaron and you were wounded like that, uh, you couldn't, you couldn't uh, do the office of a priesthood, but the average person could enter the temple to worship. Um, the, you're, you're speaking of Leviticus 21, 21, um, and, uh, and following, and that's speaking of the priests specifically and them not being able to serve as priests. Um, this is one of my favorite topics, circumcision, <laughs> cutting things off. You know, Jerry, it's not a big deal. It's for some and others, it's actually varies in size. Um, that's an important, um, oh, I know, look, it's late. Hey, I'm going to stand up for my friend, Pat Sweeney. It's 2.30 in the morning. So uh, I said to Jeff, it, it would be great. I think this, this is a great topic to close on. Um, Emasculation? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have, um, I've experienced that once. Uh, okay. <laughs> so Dennis, we'll have an after party. Um, but on, on a serious note, the conversation around, um, you know, so another great night. It's great that everybody's here. I mean, we've been two hours in. And, and this, it's just so rich. I think the conversation, I appreciate all the topics. And then the conversation to have the opportunity to have points of view and say, I want to test this out. And to have Jerry and John Shane Height, um, it's just, it's Jeff, it's just, and others, you know, I mean, there's a lot of really competent people both asking questions and sharing. And it's quite delightful. And see, I mean, I'm cool to hang around, but I, I just think it's late. We should close. If, you know, if people want to chat up, that's great. Uh, and then we'll continue on next week if that's okay. Yeah. That's like a plan. Okay. And I apologize for my inappropriate comment. Jerry encouraged me to say. He sent me a text. Um, okay. Uh, Jeff, final comments closes? No. No. Wonderful night. I think we're good to go. But. It's a great book, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is just, it, it's so great being in the word together. So, Shaney, do you want to have a word, John? Would you have a word of prayer? And then we'll, um, if, you know, if people want to chat around and, have, and talk, you're more than welcome. Love to. Oh, Father, can't say enough in thanksgiving to you. Thank you for giving us your word. And thank you for giving us the gift of your son. We really do want to live in that freedom that is mentioned in Galatians 5.1. We really want to live in our heart to where we just understand that we can be righteous in your sight simply by trust in Christ. And then we have the freedom to truly worship you out of love and not out of obligation. And Father, we bless you for thinking all this up and we bless you for (laughs) calling us into your body, making us your children and giving us the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation. And Father, we pray that this week the doors of utterance would open for us, that we would have opportunities to speak your word to people, to turn them from darkness to light. Heavenly Father, we bless you and honor you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Good day. Pat, we sleep till noon tomorrow. <laughs> oh, got an early start. So, um...
thanks very much for everything and I really enjoyed the, the evening and um, uh, we'll uh, hope to meet again next next uh, week yeah. cheers everyone good cheers. Night. Pat, Pat, Pat you're a good bloke yeah <laughs> thanks Des <laughs> <laughs> I, it's my to my benefit to be plugged in. It's just great. It really is fantastic. It's refreshing. It's so. amazing how green you are. Green shirt. Green. No, that's really true. <laughs> okay. Good night. Good night. Good night.